Okay, hello everybody. Wake up. Woo! Hi, Marian. Hi. I'm not going to introduce you because you know you had such a lovely introduction by Lisa yesterday, so there's no need, and everyone knows you, and all the people here came to hear you and listen to you and try to learn something from you because there's a lot to be learned. I think they came to hear what kind of questions you were going to ask. <laughs> Well, I'm terrified. <laughs> You're terrified. <laughs> after I told hearing, you, don't have to. After hearing her this morning, <laughs> you don't have to be terrified. We're on the same side, I think, I guess. So there's no need. I just want to learn from you more because this subject is very important to me, and I'm trying to do my best through the media to do to bring the change and. Um, Everything that you can tell us how and what to do will be great. I just, first I want to ask you about the discussion that was here this morning. Um, <laughs> who? Yeah, who? <laughs> well, you heard the uh, representative of the industry uh, saying there is no such thing as a bad food. Remember, not, a health, not healthy. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised to hear that from him? I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> he was joking, right? Um, no, no, he wasn't joking. That's the, that's the sad thing. He was, he was I mean, serious. Yeah. I mean, it sounded like the, the American Dietetic Association used to have, they don't anymore, but they used to have kind of a thing that they said over and over and over again, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as a good or a bad food. All mm -hmm. foods are part of a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. So he sounded just like that. And, um, you know, that's strictly speaking, that's true. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt to eat junk food once in a while or have sodas or candy or sugar or whatever. Those aren't poisons, but they have a very small part in healthy diets. And so the idea that if you're talking about there's no such thing as a good or a bad food, well, yes. But on the other hand, what are you advertising and trying to get everybody to, um, to eat? And how much money are you putting into trying to promote uh, fruits and vegetables as compared to whatever the processed foods are that his company makes. And I have to say, I was doing this with translation, and although the translator was very good, I, I have a feeling I missed a lot. You missed a lot. Or, I, or I, wasn't, I wasn't always... There was a lot I felt like I wasn't understanding. Mm -hmm. I'm so. sorry about that. <laughs> I'm sorry um, about that. On the other hand, I asked other people whether they understood it afterwards, <laughs> and they had trouble too. <laughs> but what, what I wonder is that, like, I felt that saying something like that, that uh, there is not, not such a thing as bad food or unhealthy food, it's like kind of old school. I mean, like, these mm -hmm. days, you cannot say things like that, especially in an audience like we have mm -hmm. here. But it's something that, I wonder if in the States, they're already, you know, understood it, that they have to change the vocabulary, the terminology. They cannot say something like that. Or they're still going and say no, they're say still, it there. No, they're still doing it. I actually posted on my blog this afternoon uh, something about the, what the Sugar Association mm -hmm. in the States is doing. They've just come out um, saying that sugar has nothing to do with body weight or obesity. It's how act physically active you are. I mean, that's part of the that's sort the of... That's the Coke research, that, that's right? The sort of, that's exactly the same mm -hmm. thing. Um, and unfortunately, they cited a paper that said something quite different from their interpretation of the paper. So I thought that was fun to post. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, didn't, I don't know if you uh, understood or caught it, but um, the ma general manager of the health um, uh, ministry said that there is not uh, uh, freedom of choice. I think that was a very strong mm -hmm. saying mm -hmm. by him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what he was saying, I think, and he was one of the people I didn't understand very oh, well. Oh, really? That's yeah. What was that business about um, the f food industry not being responsible for withdrawal of the, ad, of the advertisement, I didn't understand that. He said part. that they didn't put any uh, pressure. Yeah, and like they, they decided on their own, the Ministry of Health. Yeah. Does everybody believe that? <laughs> yeah. um, the, um, but let me go back to you. Mm -hmm, yeah. Re remind me what your question was. <laughs> no, the fact that I think uh, that oh. coming in, in a place like that and, at, at all, saying, that, uh, saying to the industry, 
mm. that when they are saying, you know, it's all freedom of choice, people have their, mm -hmm. uh, they can choose, and they can choose healthy mm -hmm. and not healthy, mm -hmm. he told them, well, it's not freedom of choice. They, I think they now start to understand that they cannot also say something like yeah. that. I mean, they're not going to get away with it with everybody, mm -hmm. but of course it's not freedom of choice. All you have to do is look at the differential amount of money that they put into advertising this product versus that product. Yeah. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. Um, they wouldn't put millions of dollars into advertising products if it didn't work. It works. Is there any place in the world that any kind of government puts I don't know, billions or millions or of uh, dollars on advertising fruit and vegetable. Is there a place like that in the world? Advertising them? Advertising so. fruit and vegetables. I don't think so. We can't even get the... Uh, the trade associations of fruit and vegetable mm -hmm. producers to do any advertising because the, first of all, they don't have a whole lot of money or they say they don't, mm -hmm. but also the fruits and the producers of fruits and vegetables consider each other as competitors. Mm -hmm. They don't see each other as allies in trying to promote public health, at least not nearly to the same extent. So whenever there are attempts to do generic advertising, um, campaigns with fruits and vegetables, they generally fight each other over it. It's so uh, sad. It's very sad. And mm -hmm. the government certainly doesn't put money into advertising because it, it supports marketing programs for specific commodities and specific foods. And for example, the peanut producers mm -hmm. and the Georgia pecan producers mm -hmm. have a generic marketing program that's sponsored by the Department mm -hmm. of Agriculture for um, sort of advertising for pecans and peanuts. And there are other, fr there's other fruits and vegetables that also have done that. But there's uh, not a national campaign no. that promotes eating vegetables or fruit. Although in New York, yeah, I was in a school and I saw posters. Oh yeah. yeah which you cannot find in Israel. The, you, can, you enter a class, and you will not find posters that uh, tell what kind of vitamins you have in carrots, what kind of vitamins you have in cucumber. So, mm -hmm. so it's better there than here. Yeah, I, can I don't tell know. You. I don't know whose posters those. I were. guess it's. It's. I think it's the New York. Uh, it may. Oh, it uh, may be New York City, yeah, City, which has big public mm -hmm. health campaigns yeah, yeah. to try to get New Yorkers to eat more healthfully, mm -hmm. because there is only one comprehensive diabetes clinic in New York City for the eight million people that live in New York City. There's only one. And there was a huge investigative report that showed that it was cheaper to do, um, um, to, do to, to cut people's feet off than yeah. it was to try to do diabetes uh, prevention. Did you see Jamie Oliver? Um, I have. Documentary he did. It was amazing. I, I, don't, seen I, the I don't know if. I, I haven't don't know seen if, the documentary. Because he, 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 t he talked about the fact of the amputation of legs. Amputation. And he brought uh, representatives of, um, of restaurants in London to a, a place, and there was. He made a huge. Like it was a pile of legs of, you know, um, show uh, dolls. Just legs, 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 legs. It was like a mountain of legs. And he told them, do you know that last week 700 uh, British people got their legs cut before because of... Uh, and that shocked them. I think, mm. I think you, you need to do something like that to shock people. People really don't know. He said that 7,000 people in the UK uh, lose their legs mm -hmm. every year. And I tracked for the numbers here in Israel. And people don't know that almost 1,300 people yeah, in Israel, every year, get their feet. Yeah, it's amazing. Hmm? 1,300 here in Israel. Hmm. So when people hear stuff like that, and they get it you know, in front of their eyes, so they start, they start to realize mm -hmm. what's going on, because mm -hmm. people really don't know how bad the situation is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, type 2 diabetes is one of those diseases that people don't really understand very well. It's, the biology is complicated, and lots of people think that it's an act of God or you know, there's nothing that you can do about it, mm -hmm. when really you can prevent it often by just changing your calorie balance yeah, yeah, yeah. and losing a couple of pounds and mm -hmm. keeping those pounds off. You don't even have to lose that much. I would like to know some more about the changes you succeeded to make in the States. Can you, can you map them? 
what kind of uh, um, uh, changes you succeeded in mm -hmm. promoting? Yeah, I mean, there are, actually, I'm very optimistic about what's happening in the States because there's so many people interested in food issues that there's really a lot happening. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing, the food in supermarkets is a lot better. Um, there's fresher food, there's more variety of foods, uh, and there are more farmers markets, there are more community supported agriculture programs where people pay in advance uh, mm -hmm. a farmer to grow foods for them and then they get the food over a period of time. Um, there's a lot of talk about fruits and vegetables and how important it is, lots and lots of groups working on campaigns. Food is better in schools. It's mm -hmm. much better in schools. It's not perfect, but it's yeah. better. Um, and there, you know, the, and my particular measure of it, because my department at NYU has a food studies program that we created in 1996. And when we started this program in food studies, which is about food and culture and food systems. Um, everybody thought we were crazy. They didn't think we'd get any students in it. And now, practically every university in America has really? some kind of food studies program where people are just coming in and asking for food in every field in which they're studying. Mm -hmm. Mathematics, biology, English, sociology, anthropology, history. All of these departments are now teaching food courses and many, many universities have gardens. Mm -hmm. Even NYU <laughs> got a garden, at least for a while. It took a long time, but we have it. What about uh, uh, people that are uh, studying to become doctors? Do they study anything about nutrition? No, that's, and, that's no, absolutely nothing. And, the, and that has not changed since I was teaching medical students in the late 1970s and early 1980s when I was at the University of California in San Francisco at the School of Medicine and writing a lot about what you had to do to teach medical mm -hmm. students about nutrition. And I had an article just last year mm -hmm. which brought it up to date f nearly 40 years later and really nothing has changed. Although my co-author on that, who was a medical student when I yeah. was at UCSF and is now an instructor, um, said that he thinks that the pressure to try to do um, team-based medical practice mm -hmm. rather than individual mm -hmm. physician-based medical practice will force the issue of nutrition into medical practice. So he's optimistic mm -hmm. that that's going to happen. I'm not because I don't know who's going to teach it. Yeah, and no. it, it, I think it's one of the biggest problem because like when a person has like the, the pre-diabetes, uh, yes? Just the beginning. And if he's going to the doctor and the doctor will not tell him to change his diet, and just give him a pill, we will not change anything. Well, because he doesn't know <clears throat> what to say. He yeah, in the States, you know, we don't have a healthcare system in the States to speak of. And if you see a doctor, you're lucky if you get 15 minutes. That's not enough to do nutrition counseling. And so maybe the thing to do is to have the physician refer patients to, to dietitians, dietitians, but then you have to make sure that the dietitians are talking about food, not mm -hmm. nutrients. The dietitians are very happy to hear that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Israel recently released data showing that uh, yeah, we are badly positioned uh, uh, in terms of childhood obesity. Mm -hmm. We were talking about it in the, in the panel. Uh, what do you think is the most effective step Israeli policy makers could take to change this? What should they do? Um, they need to do something about food in schools. Yeah. I can't believe it that you don't have food served to children in schools. We don't. How did the children go home and have lunch if the, if no, no, the, if some, mothers the, the work? small children, they have this kind of like, uh, how do you say, modonit, saharonit? Hmm? They, like they daycare. care. They yeah, get, they get, but what about they get older food, children? but it's, it's a bad, they don't cook there. That's the one, yeah. that's the main problem. Yeah, so it's that would be believer. one thing that, that, that requires a transformation and quite a bit of mm -hmm. money, I think. Um, but that's the one place where you can model for children what healthy food looks like um, and make that the norm. Um, and that's why there's been so much effort in the states to try to improve the quality of the school meals. Mm -hmm. um, and they've succeeded to some extent. Mm -hmm. has a long way to go, but there's a, it's yeah. much better now than it was 10 years ago. Yeah, okay, that's great to hear. Um, 
you met with the leadership, right, of the uh, health department here? You met briefly. With them? <laughs> briefly. Ah, it was brief. How long was the meeting? A half hour. I half think. hour. Mm. Uh -huh. You spoke most of the time, or no, they asked they questions? Spoke. <laughs> they spoke. <laughs> <laughs> what did they tell you? Um, well, they asked questions about, um, you know, where you would start if you were going to do a healthy food campaign. Mm -hmm. um, but it sounded to me as if all of the things that I was talking about had been considered or were under consideration, and that there was real interest mm -hmm. in the health department for actually taking some action. Yeah, and if is. that's true, then this is something that everybody should be supporting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> they are. They are. Uh, it seems like that. Um, did you recommend them some kinds of policy or things to do? Did you give them like one to three what to do? I can't even say this without choking. <laughs> but, but limits on marketing to children. Yeah. <laughs> limits, limits on uh, marketing and publishing. Uh, I mean like uh, publicity or just uh, marketing? I mean like what about advertising in television and... Well, advertising and television are part of marketing. Mm -hmm. so, so, no, no <coughs> advertising and television for kids? Uh, for kids. No? Up to the age of 18, how's mm -hmm. that? <laughs> you told them that? I don't think we talked about age, but oh. we certainly talked okay. about restrictions on marketing to children. Mm -hmm. And I think it's something that's being considered. And in the States, that's politically impossible. Uh, and it's politically impossible because the food industry is so strong and everyone feels that you must work with the food industry mm -hmm. to try to make these changes. And we heard quite a lot about that at this conference. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a complicated issue. Yes, you need to work with the food industry, but on the other hand, you need to set some li limits on if the food industry is doing things that are promoting poor health, then you want to set some limits on that. Um, and that seems like a completely reasonable thing to do from a societal perspective. Uh, societies need healthy people. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be, uh, at least in, the, in, the, in America, we do lots and lots of things to support the food industry in promoting foods that aren't healthy for people. Like what? What kind of we allow food? them to deduct the cost of marketing from taxes, mm. for example. That's just one thing. Uh, and we support the, we, we with subsidies support the production of some foods but not others. And those uh, foods and fruits and vegetables don't get any public support. Mm -hmm. Other foods get public support. Yeah. So there are lots of contradictions mm -hmm. in the way the uh, policies work and those could be in a smaller country. You have the opportunity to clean mm -hmm. that up. Mm -hmm. Are there any countries we, uh, we should take inspiration from? Oh, Scandinavia. Scandinavia. Seems to Finland. be do Finland? It. Yeah, well, Finland and uh, Denmark and Norway, all of them have policies that are aimed at trying to keep the population healthier. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some <coughs> examples? Well, there are, they have more restrictions on marketing to children than we do. They, the pricing is different for various kinds of foods. Mm -hmm. There are limits on advertising. Um, there's a whole series of... The tax sugar uh, added the, I'm product? Not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure, sure what mm -hmm. the tax situation mm -hmm. is. Um, but Britain has just passed mm -hmm. a sugar tax. Yeah. And there are if lots Mexico of... Mexico is considered a success by the... Uh, it's considered a partial success. Mm -hmm. uh, Mexico passed a tax mm -hmm. on sugar-sweetened beverages in 2014, and everybody's waiting to see what's going to happen, and there are some problems with that. W one is that the tax was much lower than what the advocates wanted. It was half mm -hmm. of yeah. the level that the advocates wanted. Another is that there are lots of different ways in which people are trying to track whether the tax has reduced consumption, and there are big arguments about whether it's reduced consumption. The soda industry says that consumption is up. The advocates say that per capita consumption is down, mm -hmm. so because the population is getting larger. But the real issue with that tax is that the money is not necessarily going to the purpose for which it was promised. Really? What the Mexican government said 
said in passing the tax was that it would use the revenues for improving the to quality of water in school. Uh, water? It because was going I to be water in education. Schools. No, it was going to go for, because mm -hmm. it's not, because Mexico doesn't have clean water. Mm -hmm. And so they were going to have clean water in schools, and then they were going to work on trying to get clean water into mm -hmm. cities. And it's not clear that all of the money is going to that purpose. Mm -hmm. It's being used for other fiscal purposes as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not clear how the Mexico situation is going to play out. One of the problems is the, when there's no clear water, they drink Coke. They drink well, exactly. Yeah. That, exactly. I mean, that was one mm -hmm. of the ways in which Coca-Cola got yeah. established in Mexico was this is a way in which you'll have clean hydration, right? The healthy, magic word. Healthy beverage. Yeah, healthy <laughs> beverage hydration. And so Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and all of the sugary beverages in mm -hmm. the 1980s and 90s had a very deliberate campaign to try to get people to drink sodas instead of water, mm -hmm. and they are deeply embedded in yeah. Mexican rural culture right now. Exactly. Deeply yeah. embedded. In, in poor, poor places, yes. very poor places, yes. <coughs> and then the, the teeth problem and everything that comes with it, and the diabetes. Um, well, you heard that the food industry uh, claims to listen to the customers. They do things, they lower mm. the... Uh, sold and the, and the sugar mm. and everything, they do it voluntarily. Uh, are these steps considered healthy? You consider them healthy steps? Well, this gets back to the whole question of do you work with the food industry or not? Mm -hmm. Or do you regulate it? And there, <clears throat> and I think you know, reasonable people have very different views about this. My own is that you must regulate because voluntarily these companies cannot do what you want mm -hmm. them to if it's going to lose the money. Um, because they're businesses and their job is to make money. I mean, it's really that simple. Yeah. And, the, and for publicly traded companies in America, uh, they have stockholders to please and the stockholders get very, very cross if they don't get high returns on their investment. Um, so the companies can do a lot of things for show, but the minute it starts costing them money, they can't do it. And I think there's an example of Pepsi-Cola, which decided some years ago that it was going to be a wellness company in the United States, and it was going to promote wellness and all these hel healthy drinks. Mm -hmm. And the minute that full sugar Pepsi-Cola dropped in consumption below Coca-Cola and Diet Coke mm -hmm. and went to the number three place, the stockholders went berserk and that was the end of that. Um, and then all the money went back into promoting full sugar Pepsi-Cola mm -hmm. again. So the companies are up against a very difficult situation. Mm -hmm. They real, at least The companies in the states realize that they must act to produce healthier food for themselves, for people, and for the planet, because there's so much demand for that. Mm -hmm. And so they're all looking for ways to do that. Mm -hmm. And a very easy way is to shave a little sodium off and to shave a little sugar off, and that's fine, um, but it doesn't go far enough. Yeah. And the salt issue is particularly difficult because... Why? The, um, because the people don't like the taste of food if it doesn't have a lot of salt in it. And the companies feel that they can't sell their products if it doesn't have a lot of salt in it. So they're extremely resistant to reducing salt. If they reduce mm -hmm. the salt and people don't buy the product, the salt mm -hmm. comes right back. Mm -hmm. And that's why the regulation is essential. Um, because what is the most effective regulation? Is oh, to put some limits on the amount of sodium that mm -hmm. uh, food companies can put in their products and to do it gradually. Yeah. Um, and that happened in Great Britain where um, the companies under great pressure from the government voluntarily across the board started to reduce the amount of salt in their products and there was either by coincidence or because it was causally related, um, the incidence of stroke went down and it went down by a lot. And so that made everybody think this was a really good thing to do. And then a new government came in, and that was the end of that. And it's hard to sort out whether this was because of a general secular trend or it was because of the actual mm -hmm. action that took place. But because of the way people's salt taste works, everybody has to reduce it by the same, <clears throat> to the same level at mm -hmm. the same time. Yeah. 
or, um, and it has to be done in restaurants too. I find restaurant f food to be extremely salty. And if you talk to chefs about it mm -hmm. and the cooks about it, it doesn't taste salty to them. It tastes just right to them. And so they don't want to reduce it because their customers are used they're to used it. They're used to it. Yeah, it's uh, very, so, it's, so it takes so time to change. So that's difficult. Habits of taste, of course. Um, let's talk about uh, um, uh, funding research. You talked about it yesterday a bit in your, in your lecture. Uh, uh, the fact that how it affects uh, uh, dietary guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, how can we solve this problem of biased research? What can we do? Well, you, well, all, I mean, I think there are people who would say that all research is biased. Um, but I think that food industry sponsorship of research introduces a bias that's qualitatively different from other kinds of biases. Every researcher has a hypothesis <clears throat> and wants to prove that hypothesis, and that's bias. Um, but the food industry's purpose in funding research is to get research that they can use in marketing. And there's lots of evidence for that. Uh, I mean, for example, the Mars company funds lots and lots of research on the health benefits of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know what to say. Um, chocolate is not a health food. Chocolate has a place in healthful diets. I'm not going to tell you not to eat chocolate. I might tell you not to eat too much. Not pounds at a time, please. <laughs> or it depends what kind of chocolate, you yeah. know, if it's... Yeah, oh, and then they could say, well, the really bitter, bitter. the intensely has bitter some uh, has some uh, mm. antioxidants yeah. in it. But there's mm. very little evidence that those particular antioxidants mm. are going to make people healthier. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to prove that people who eat chocolate are healthier than people who don't. Although maybe they're, you know, they're, you could argue that these are people who are more relaxed about their diets and they eat a more of a variety of food and they have healthy attitudes towards food. Um, and I'm for that. Uh, but the, um, you know, these things are very hard to prove. And the egg industry funds research to prove that eggs don't raise cholesterol levels. And the pork industry funds research to prove that pork um, is associated with healthy outcome and no heart disease. And you could find these studies over and over and over again. And in fact, I got so annoyed about it a couple of years ago that I started collecting these um, on my, I write a daily blog, and I started collecting these on my blog every time I had five industry-funded studies that came out with results favorable to that particular company or that particular industry, I'd post them. And I did that for a year. And at the end of the year, I had 168 studies, and 12 of them, all of them industry funded, and only 12 of them came out with results that were not in favor of the company that had funded them, and the other 156 were. And they represent, I haven't done the full analysis on it yet, I have a, a graduate student who's working on that even as we speak, um, and, but but the, the number of food companies that sponsor research has gotten larger and larger and larger, and you can hardly find a food producer that isn't funding research that they can use in marketing. And there are headlines, and I have examples of uh, press releases with headlines um, that tell you the wonderful things that this particular is, food is there a way does. to make them publish that you know the conflict of interest mm -hmm. inside is there you know, a way to make yeah, them most uh, most professional journals require mm -hmm. now require uh, disclosure of who mm -hmm. paid for the study and whether the authors had conflicts of interest with the company that funded the study uh, in the past. And so there's sort of two kinds of conflicts. There's studies that are just paid for, paid for by the dairy industry. The dairy industry funds a lot of studies in the States because there are a lot of people